So yeah, thanks very much for everyone for coming along for the um, Soil CRC Community of Practice for everybody. Um, we'll start now with Hannah Beth Luke, who's going to give us a rundown on the um, surveying farm practices and um, farmer decision making. Um, and we can have about sort of three quarters of an hour or so um, with Hannah Beth and then we'll have a bit of a break. And uh, Michael Roach from University of Tasmania with Richard Doyle will join us um, and we'll cover off on um, soil mapping and some digital soil mapping. So um, that is the plan for today. I um, won't keep you, um, we'll be here for a few hours rather than all day. So um, thanks again for, for making the time to join us and um, yeah, Hannah Beth, I'm happy to introduce you and um, from the Southern Cross University and perhaps Hannah Beth, you could yeah, tell us a bit more um, about um, the work that you're doing and some of the other work that you do with Southern Cross University as well. Thanks Felicity, thanks so much for the invitation to speak with you all uh, today. And um, yeah, so I'm at Southern Cross, I'm a senior lecturer in our Faculty of Science and Engineering. My background has been in science and environmental science but my um, research training since my undergrad has really been looking at social dimensions of land use change. And I'm really interested in the, the, the different elements that are driving farmer decision makings that relate to how they manage their soils across Australia. I also do have um, also involved in coordinating some of the regenerative agriculture courses at Southern Cross University. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I'll get started. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview on the project today. Um, just a little bit of insight in how we get the information and what we do, and then, then a little bit just at some insight into some of the data that's coming out of the project. Um, I understand I've got about 15 minutes, Felicity. So yeah, yep, 20 minutes. So yep. um, before I before I go in, I mean, it's, a, it's a really multifaceted project. We've got uh, I'm presenting today as a project leader, but we have an enormous amount of people involved in the project and every one of them is absolutely essential to it. Um, and, and especially our local our partners who we co-developed the survey with. So I'd like to thank all of all of them. And Catherine, who's here today too, um, is in our project. Um, so the project is overall around now understanding this perennial issue, which I know that a lot of the communities and practice groups are, are looking at trying to work on, which is why some farmers are wanting to engage practices and others don't. Um, understanding that there's lots of lots of things drive farmer decision making and some of those are economic, some of them environmental and lots are also social. So we're really looking to focus in on those with the ultimate aim being to um, understand how grower groups and our part, regional partners, our local CMAs that are engaged, can better engage with their growers and, and how um, the needs of growers can drive future research strategies and R&D for local grower groups and also for the soil CRC itself. Um, so it's, an, it's, a, it's run in every state. We work with local partners to run a survey in every state. And we are, we've, we've now conducted three surveys. Um, and uh, we're, it's a well-established survey methodology. It's a mail out on which we, we post out surveys and remind us to a selected region. Um, but we purpose built each surveys for every region. Um, and the, a really key element of the survey is that our regional partners have a lot of input into the design. Uh, and it's spatially referenced data as well. So that means that we're able to um, look at, say, the relationship between what farmers are doing and their practices and their soil type as well. So we can map that spatially with, with the data that comes out of this. And the Soil CRC also has a milestone to do more surveys in, in four to five years time. Um, so we can also measure change in time. So here's a little, uh, just a, an example here of what the spatial data can do. This is, this is just by local government area. And this is in, from our, our survey in the North Central Victoria. And just um, if you look at the full-time farmers is the dark part of the circle. You can see the further you go away from Melbourne, the more full-time farmers you have. So when you can present data spatially, it can as, as a really nice different element to, to, to your understanding. Um, so as I said, we're, we're running a survey in, in every state. We looked at North Central Victoria with working with the North Central CMA. Uh, we've worked with um, AREP uh, and the Landscape Board and PERSA in South Australia. 
in Western Australia, we have West Midlands Group, Levy Group, Wheat Belt, NRM, and Wantfa, uh, who we're partnering with there. And we've just, we've completed up Victorian and South Australian surveys and reports, um, and Western Australian surveys just finished, and our report is just about to be sent out to our partners. So you're going to get a bit of a sneak preview into some of the data today, because it's, it's um, so that, that's exciting. Um, and also New South Wales will be planning to run one over this winter in, in Central West um, with our partner Central West Farming Systems um, and, um, and also uh, the local land services group in Queensland. Um, we're, we're working in the Burdekin with the Burdekin um, Farming Systems Group and we'll also be last running a survey in Tasmania with our partner um, Southern Farming Systems. So just a little bit of insight into how it all works and how we've set up our surveys and then a bit of, of, of information because how it works is really important because it really, it, I think it demonstrates that the, the results that come out of this really are farmer driven and that's and that's what this project is all about. But it's based on all these um, so sociological principles that the values that we have and the beliefs and the norms, the things that others are doing around us will guide um, the decisions that we make. Um, and understanding that all of these things will influence um, management practices and there are some things that we can't change but we can better understand. There are some things that we can change. We can improve farmer knowledge and confidence in different technologies um, and if we're able to better engage farmers we can potentially improve management practices as well. So the way that we go about this, identifying priorities that go in each survey is part of a co-design process and this is um, this is the AREP and Landscape Board group from South Australia, this is the committee there, and so we run, we, we work with the local partners, we invite um, key, key persons from a region to develop the priorities for the survey, which will relate to the needs of that, um, of the local groups. Um, so this particular workshop, which uh, we've been in Minipa, um, on the Eyre Peninsula, we found that key things were looking at, they wanted to understand how to come together as a group, what was happening for young farmers in particular, and how to build farm resistant resilience into the future and how to adapt. So these were the key priority areas that came out. Um, and, and that's what we then put questions through the survey to try and understand the different elements um, to be able to answer their key questions that we bring together in, in the report. So that's what the survey looks like. We, we sent it, send it out um, either to a random sample across a region or to all landholders in a selected region um, with properties over 10 hectares. So it goes out to everyone um, and they mail them back to us. We send them lots of reminders and then we write up a report um, <laughs> which is available on the Soil CRC website for those of you who might be interested in and also there's a short sort of summary sheet that's, that's available as well. So a big part of this project is providing really good information that can get back to growers in the easiest way possible. But the key thing that's really important as well is that what we're doing can feed into strategic planning for our grower group. So this is um, out uh, last month on the Air Peninsula in Port Lincoln, um, where we were able to put some input into the, the strategic planning day that they were doing and, um, and, and be able to provide real measures for their strategic planning, like the number of, the level of membership in the region and people who, the proportion of people who'd heard of them um, can really be embedded into strategic targets as well. Um, and uh, this is just a, an infographic that we put together as a result as, as well. Don't worry, I won't be testing you at all these details, but just to show you some of the things that we're doing to try and um, um, present our results to communities. And Naomi presented these findings at the lower, uh, uh, at one of the uh, uh, field days recently. So, um, so that's the, the methodology. That's how we get to gain the information. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of insight into some of the different things that have come from the project. So looking at farming structures, we look at um, different types of farm, uh, management styles on farms. So we have full-time farmers, part-time farmers um, across regions. We found this was in particularly in the north central catchment management area. This was really important. There were a lot of different types of farmers and a big proportion of them across the areas. But this has been quite different between South Australia and the northern wheat belt um, because there's just so such a larger proportion of farmers in the region. Um, so we're able to get this demographic and understanding of, of what practices are out there. Um, 
but also we're able to find out what is important to farmers and what are the things that are driving their decision makers and, and decision, decision making. Uh, so in South Australia, we looked at, we have a range of values that we ask farmers to, to rate as important. And this is one thing that came out as, as key across surveys, the ability to pass on a, a healthy and more sustainable farm for future generations. This, this really seems to be a number one thing for farmers across the board. We also look at the information that farmers are, are gaining and where they get that information from, which could be really important for our, our partners in targeting where they will, will target information in the future. And we look at channels and we look at sources, so ways of conveying the information um, and ways of, and, and the, the sources of that as well. So um, we're interested in what farmers find important across the region, what the regional issues are. Um, and we're also interested in what the soil issues on the property of the farmer as well. And we found that these can vary substantially across regions. Um, so just to compare a little bit uh, across the regions, we found that issues across the landscape have actually been quite different across regions. So in North Central Victoria, uh, and northern wheat belt, it's actually changes in weather patterns was the number one issue. Um, in north central Victoria, it, it, issues around dams and irrigation were, were really, really important. But it's important to note those questions weren't even in the other surveys because there's very little irrigation. It's, it's just not an issue because it doesn't really happen there. In South Australia, um, the absence of uh, on the Air Peninsula of, of services was seen as a really key issue. Um, and support for new and young farmers came out as really important on the Air Peninsula as well, as well as water security, which is obviously related to changing climate. But support for new and young farmers came out as important. Also, we found through looking at uh, our data across those three regions uh, that there were just a lot more younger farmers on the Air Peninsula. They're just, there was such a small amount in Victoria um, uh, and Western Australia who filled in the survey um, that we were um, just, we weren't able to, to analyze their, their results in a, in a different group because the numbers were just so low. Whereas in South Australia, we, we uh, divided it up, the ages up by generation and found that there was a significant number of younger farmers there um, who filled the survey in. Um, we also found public support or opposition for agricultural practices popped up as quite as in, quite important. That actually came up as number four in on the Air Peninsula as well. Um, information sources. Like one of the key things that we're finding across these regions is that there's such there's very few things that actually are similar across regions. There are lots of differences, even in the way people are using information. So, whereas you can see here that in, in the different areas, there's there's some very different ways of using information. And then when you start to divide um, the, the farmers up by age, again, you, you do find what you'd expect, which is that there are more younger farmers moving towards the use of websites in, um, and um, say Facebook or Twitter rather than newspapers or things like that. Um, so there is differences by age again, but, um, so, but we did find it also to note other farmers wasn't an option in the North Central survey, but that's come up as a really, really important source of information, which can create a, obviously a pool of knowledge and just emphasizes the importance of other farmers in, 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 in that knowledge sharing and trust in other people is, is a really important thing in terms of how people gain knowledge. So trust in the organizations, the partner organizations, and also in, in um, government departments that are providing agricultural information. Uh, is really really important but people tend to trust people they know um, some generational differences we found in south australia is that um so the generation y so that's 1918 younger were the most um likely to include another person in their decision making they felt less um supported to con in their farming activities and were slightly less likely to be um, involved with industry groups farming systems groups 
this is some of our West Australian data, hot off the press. Um, so here you can see, even in practices, so between just between those who are 57 and over and 56 years and under, people who are intending, <laughs> maybe it just shows young people have got better, more intentions, <laughs> but there are some differences coming out in terms of intended practices in the future as well. But there are some really important common, common elements and, and that number one um, value held by farmers, which are the ones that they attach particularly to their farm, was this ability to pass on a healthier farm for future generations. And um, looking after my family and, and their needs was really important across regions, um, but also um, creating wealth and preventing pollution came up as, as key across regions. So just want to zoom in a little bit on one of the things that we can do with this data, I know I'm pretty much coming up to time, um, but soil, so actually looking at what the issues are, and this I hope might be a part of a focus of our future efforts, understanding what's important to farmers. Um, so you've got the issue on the left-hand side there and the practices um, on the next, on, and then their confidence in those practices and then knowledge of those practices over on the right-hand side. When you start to bring this together, you can start to get an understanding of what might be some of the, the barriers to change. If you want to change practices or have a particular innovation or idea that you want adopted or, um, so just something as simple as, as soil testing, we found that around, this, and this was common across regions, but only half of farmers were doing testing of, of, of soils. Um, and uh, seeing it as a, an essential first step was, was no was was no issue, but um, preparing a nutrient budget again not such a high proportion. But then when you start to look at again at the knowledge levels of different in relation to different um, issues and practices, you can you can start to potentially focus efforts of the farming systems groups on on those those elements. So again, this is all from our South Australian data. Ah, yes, and practices you might want to target. So bringing all of this together, from our surveys, we're able to better understand what, what is motivating people, what might encourage them to change, and then identify the things that can be changed and support strategic planning for our local grower groups that's informed from, by farmer needs across regions. And in, in, in that way, hopefully we can achieve that long-term goal, the soil CRC to improve, uh, imp improve soil, strip, so, soil stewardship across Australia in healthier landscapes and uh, productive farms. So this is just how it all fits together. Uh, so we can improve um, practices for the future. So just to summarize, our, our surveys are designed with our local partners to come up with the main topics and things that are, are relevant to each region and they can draw out a whole range of different elements um, related to demographics and practices, all sorts of things. Um, and, but the key thing that we're trying, we, we, the reason that we're doing this work is to have high value for our farmer groups, for the soil CRC, and ultimately for Australian farmers. And, but what's really exciting about this project is that we're able to create a national data set about what, what farmers are doing across Australia. So it's a really exciting opportunity to to gain up that broader understanding of what's happening as the project continues. So thank you so much, everyone. And um, I just, if anyone has any questions, uh, that'd be great. Thanks, Hannah Beth. That was a, a, um, a great little summary and run through of an enormous amount of work that you do. It must um, to be able to talk about it in 20 minutes when really, um, you know, the amount of work goes into it is much, <laughs> much greater than that. But um, very powerful information to be able to help support uh, groups to support landholders, you know, with that decision making and that sort of thing. Um, so Nadine's and yeah, so if you guys have got a question, feel free to unmute your microphone so that you can ask. Um, very happy for you to pop in or you can pop some questions in the chat. So Nadine has asked, what was the response rate to the survey? Yeah. And did this change a lot in different regions? Yes, this has this has varied quite a bit actually across regions. 
uh, in North Central Victoria, it was 41%. Uh, in, on the Eyre Peninsula, it was 31%. But of that 31%, um, all of them own two properties. So <laughs> on average, not all of them. Um, so, so we actually probably represented a much larger area than, than potentially just a third. Um, and um, in the wheat belt northern, of Northern Australia, we're looking at around 25%. So it was quite a bit lower there. So um, yeah, it's, so yeah, I think that that can vary a lot. And like, I do think um, there's a whole range of things that can influence that. And it, it can be a matter of, I mean, in WA, the harvest came a little early. Um, in, in South Australia, COVID happened. We had, we were posting things out and, and things were, one thing, to, one one little um, uh, note took a uh, reminder notice took six months to arrive. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been it's been a bit of an interesting journey in that regard through COVID. Yeah, and that that is one of the big challenges is um, trying to get a great uh, response rate, isn't it? So that you can have that. Yes. Yeah. But what's numbers really to be able to make. Exactly, but I do think, um, you know, for I wasn't able to go over to, to Western Australia as much as I would have liked to promote the survey and, and um, that, that does make a really big difference. The more you can, you know, like it, it, with anything, getting to know the, the local groups and them getting to know you. And in South Australia, I was able to go to a field day and present on the survey, which I wasn't able to do um, in Western Australia. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's all of those things are really important. Um, uh, uh, how was each committee chosen and were committee numbers limited? Yeah, for, for developing the survey, another good question. Um, no, numbers weren't limited. It was really um, down to the local grower groups and our local partners to decide um, what, how each, each um, committee would, would be um, formed. So, um, and it also depended on the level of involvement. Some of our partners had um, a bit more of a bit more of a role than others so it related to again local relationships and participation and things like that um do you think podcasts could be a good channel for engaging with younger farmers yeah i think i think so i do actually um looking at the the the, the information around how they're using information podcast is becoming more popular and i think not actually just for younger farmers with some of the we what was wonderful in, in North Central Victoria is we were able to actually look at changes. There was a survey that, a very similar survey that took place in 2014. So we were able to look at changes in use of different information sources over time. And certainly overall, for all ages, more people were using online uh, engagements like podcasts and websites and email lists and messenger groups and things like that. Yeah, thanks, Hannah Beth. I think a um, hi, Misty. <laughs> That's Misty, not Jade. <laughs> um, uh, one of those, one of the results that um, came up was around the Gen Y not necessarily engaging with groups. I think was was one of the um, outcomes which I found quite interesting because I think. Um, well, with the people in the room, um, we all work in groups, <laughs> you know, we're a grower group or we're an NRM organisations that are working with land care groups or, um, yeah, other soils groups, for example. So I find I found that one quite, uh, yeah, a bit confronting because that's our next generation, really. I mean, the uh, and I guess that's another thing around demographics. What what is the age group? You know, of the what was the most popular age group of farmers from that survey? And are, and are those Gen Y? Are they the main? Um, are they the highest generation um, percentage farming at the moment? And if they're not going to engage in groups, how do we engage with those? And I guess that's where Asia's um, question around podcasts. Um, comes in but yeah I don't know if you've got a comment around that well I think that there was a few things that came out right when we started to look at the the data by age and one thing that popped out that sort of surprised us um, was that there were more economic and business related value the, the more economic and business related values were more important 
for the younger farmers um, and more dominant than the say the environmental values for the which were more dominant for the older farmers so there are a few things there that it's very difficult to know from from a survey because you know a survey can give you an example a, a, an overview of what's happening in a region and they ne don't necessarily tell you why which which i guess is the beauty of the soil crc because we're able to do different types of research in regions and focus groups could start to draw out why but might that it could be you know i guess the two main things could be that one farmers younger farmers don't care as much you know, or it could also be that they're just at a different stage of life. Um, so they're, they're, they're managing, and this is the same for grower group participation as well. When we ask people why they um, didn't have time, why, why they didn't go to field days or events, it was usually time, conflicting arrangements, other jobs, family responsibilities. And younger uh, people of younger generations are by definition um, you know, at busier times of life. So um, I think those elements could play into it as well but I do think that's an area that would be really good to to nut out a bit more with some qualitative research yeah and it's often though that age group um you know with towns population decreasing you know it's the same people that have to go to footy training or, or turn up at the footy field the same people that have to do the volunteering for the RFS or the CFA, the same people that have to, you know, keep the town and the community, extracurricular community stuff going. So um, they are, as well as run their business <laughs> and, their, and look after their family. So yes, there is that time poor. And, and Helen, um, Helen and Aisha and Nadine <laughs> are all agreeing and saying that, um, yeah, struggling with that grower engagement and getting feedback. And the feedback is that because their farms are getting bigger, um, they're too busy to show up to events. So that's a worry in that uh, how do we encourage them to, um, to value the professional development, I suppose, that, that uh, grower groups can offer you know, in field days and and those sort of things. So I'm wondering if if that's a question that could be asked. Um, you know, not just where do you get your information from or what is what what do you value? And I suppose those things can can help feed um, events. You know, what's important to them, but also getting them to think about well. Uh, how are you going to find out information about those things? Um, yeah, I don't know, from a professional development, valuing that professional development type yeah. activities. Well, yeah. We did ask, we did ask question, you know, what, 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 what could best support your farming and activities and, and who they do rely on? Because we're really interested in, um, we're, we're well aware that the person who fills in the survey um, may, it, there, there is a bit of, evidence to suggest that they're, that they're more likely to be an older male that's sort of they might be a bit more trusting or have a bit more time to fill in a, a survey for example so we've been asking questions around who else is on the farm who else is involved in decision making um and you know those those kind of things can be really helpful as well and how how people are getting support so um people do spend quite a bit of time you know is, quite a bit of um quite a bit of, sorry a number of people really draw on the, the family as a whole to make decisions and other people there but private agronomists and independent agronomists was also really really important um as an information source so i guess when people are short on time they rely on others to get the information for them and that's that's certainly a trend and that's i think emphasizes the importance of the role of extension officers and people who have the information and can present that information in a really concise way and, and often person to person rather than necessarily. I mean, yeah, so, but I, I think I know that um, certainly the West Midlands groups involved doing more podcasts and they're finding them to be really effective. Um, so it's, I think I like the idea of running a field day at night, Nadine, that's, that's excellent, an excellent idea <laughs> after, after bedtime, <laughs> seven o'clock. <laughs> Did you have um, big lights out, Nadine, or was it more of a, a workshop? Um, sort of thing? Hi, guys. Um, what it was was actually a seeding demo, but with fluorescent dye so that we needed it to be night time to see the soil throw. Um, but we chose that activity because we knew 
it had to be night time. Um, so we started at five o'clock and it was marketed as beer and barbecue. Um, yeah. And then we had it um, at a little like, regional hall where there was no infrastructure, um, I guess, no police. Um, <laughs> yeah, it worked. I was surprised. We don't have a lot of farmers in our area anyway. There's probably only 50, but we got 35, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, good. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I, we've tried uh, breakfast meetings, sort of get them before they get too busy. Um, but that can be a trick if you've got um, larger farms who have got to get farm workers ready for the morning. You know, often they want to be there first thing in the morning to give out instructions and, and those sort of things. So I think just asking those questions around, you know, what time of the day and those sort of things. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Aisha said they're, they're um, thinking about doing a movie night where the whole family can come along. So, um, yeah. I think it's about getting the balance right. And again, every region's different and there's different times of year where some people are really wanting and waiting for that social opportunity. And other times it's just another another thing. So it's just trying to get that balance right. It's, it's not a small, uh, small or easy task. Yeah. Yeah, good. And um, one of the, uh, um, sorry, I, I don't want to butt in all the time. So if anyone's got any other questions, please um, do butt in. But I was, one of the things that I struggle with, with, with some of the surveys and um, in the funding um, programs that we're in at the moment, like you said, it's uh, a lot of the, although we, we may be able to influence some practice change, a lot of the funding is around skills and knowledge so that at least we can, and confidence, so that we can give landholders um, information and, and so we can see a change in their knowledge or skills or confidence. Um, I have trouble, and I don't know if you've got any um, advice around it, but you asked them around their current knowledge, I suppose. I noticed that you did there as well. so. It's sort of, you know, you can ask them at the start of a project, you know, what you think your current knowledge is or what your skills are. And it's a, often it can be a case of where they don't know what they don't know. And, yeah. and so yeah. they can say, yes, I know everything about it. And then you're sort of going, ah, well, yeah. And so you've got sort of no wriggle room. I'm not sure how you... How you can only ever measure their self-assessed knowledge unless you start introducing questions. And, I, and that has been done in previous research, you know, you people are given a, a question that can, can is a basic knowledge level question that you're either a, you either pass or you fail and <laughs> and that can be used to you know, as, as a soil we could do that we could do something like that ask them to <laughs> do a little yeah. test but it, it <laughs> but it does create a bit of a different dynamic in the survey <laughs> yeah so yeah yes yeah you don't want to put them off from if they, they don't you don't want to make it feel like they're being tested yeah, but, you know, right. the risk um, with that. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? From... Yeah, another comment from Raymond. Yeah. A Saturday matinee on soil health. Love it. Videos in a group with a chat discussion that sounds like a great idea yeah yeah yep that's great yeah and these are the sort of things i guess um where we can come together and talk about our different experiences and share those uh those wins and um opportunities to try some different things and like you were saying yes the podcasts where um if larger farms have got auto steer and those sort of things I can just pop that on and listen to them um, and those sort of things in fact um, during last year when we couldn't get together we ran uh, you know I was running online discussions with landholders and yeah some of them were on tractors cutting hay but they could still have their phone and dial into a web meeting and um, and listen or contribute if they if they wanted to while they're on their tractors so Mm -hmm. Yeah, those sorts of things can be really, really helpful, I think. It's something that's provided they've got the connectivity out. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and that's one of the issues that was raised, wasn't it? Connectivity. Yeah, it certainly was. It was a huge one on the Air Peninsula. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, 
Thanks. Thanks, Hannah Beth. That was, that was terrific. And um, I think you were being involved in a facilitated, or you'll be at uh, Southern Cross Uni facilitating the session uh, for Wednesday when all the participants come together. Yes, yeah, so yeah, everyone's welcome to come to the Lismore campus if you're nearby. Uh, so we'll be running the local um, meeting uh, where we'll watch uh, the Soul CRC events across the country. So it'd be lovely to meet any of you who might be able to make it. Yeah, great. Um, and like you said, we can jump onto the Soil CRC website and have a look at some of the reports that have come out of Hannah Beth's um, results so far. So I'll see if I can find those and link those in as well. Yeah, those are just under the, they're in the uh, reports and research section. So the, the links are both up there. So. Yeah. Yeah. And when do you think the WA results will be? When will they be on the website? Okay, well, we're, we're just about, um, we've got our advanced draft. We're just about to send it out. Um, so it'll probably, hopefully about a month should be on the website as soon as we can. <laughs> and, um, did you have different, cause you had, you, you were working with four different groups in WA. Did you have a different survey for each of those no, groups? No. So we were, I ran, I actually ran workshops with one fur in the West Midlands group. And in that, in the case of that survey, um, the Wheatbelt NRM and Levy group joined us a bit later. So, um, the process there was that we ran copies of the drafts past um, key stakeholders. Um, I know Felicity's here. She's, she was one of them in, in Western Australia. And they were happy with those drafts and suggested some um, other questions be included. Um, but yeah, but we didn't run the full workshops with everyone. So in yeah. on the air peninsula, it worked to run one and we brought everyone together. Whereas in Western Australia, we ran two separate workshops. And then it was more of a to and fro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. All righty. Well, um, yeah, thanks again, Hannah Beth. And we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch and uh, hopefully um, we can, yeah, we'll get some more info around this topic of um, farmer decision making and uh, designing um, work to support landholders. Um, one of the questions which I think was brought up early in, in when we got together, just before we go, I keep thinking of things, um, was around um, trying to marry up where the research dollars are coming with um, farmers and landholders' values and needs and, and wants, if you like, that there's, there is, can be a bit of a disconnect between you know, land care saying, we're, we're going to give you money for soil carbon and wind erosion when farmers are sort of saying, well, I don't really care about soil carbon and wind erosion, um, but you're sort of, yeah, forced into trying to deliver on those things and the so landholders excited about them and, and that sort of thing. That, that's the thing, you know, if it really is important and it's key that research is driven by what farmers are needing and wanting. And that's the beauty of the surveys, that the soil CRC itself can look back and refer to these surveys and say, right, these are the things that are important to these region in, in these regions to people. And these are the things that are that they're doing, these are the things they're not doing. This is what they need. So you can actually build it, it, it isn't it isn't just about uh, farmers standing off into a, an open space. It's actually going to, it, it connects directly with the with the scientists as well, I would hope. Um, in terms of future priorities for the CRC itself. And I know that David Fallopo's project was related to, to doing exactly that as well, working back on regional capacity building. And um, so there's lots that's been happening in the soil CRC, aside from the survey projects, that's been quite complementary in doing that work. But um, I think working in that knowledge sharing space, both between um, farmers and, and in the soil CRC and, and also from in that translation of science or sharing that science with scientific knowledge with farmers and then and then in that other direction as well so how to um figure out what farmers are doing that's working and 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 then help that to also drive the, the research to help build the evidence base for, for for different practices yes yeah and certainly with um future fund um being able to um you know, say that we have a certain percentage of farmers who are interested in this particular topic that we are asking money for um, to support the, the landholders in the region um, yep. certainly helps. Yep. 
absolutely can help help to drive that R and D by supporting mm. them. Yeah, um, and just a question from Emma. Um, around group size was there any analysis on group size and function yes yeah we we, we had a um, for each in each region we asked people if they were a member of the group or if they're associated with our group with our partner groups and then what they expected from that group so whether they to that, that they could be relied on to provide good information the extent to which they um, should be a lobby or an advocacy group or not um, uh, so and whether yeah so uh, and also their membership and also in, in some cases whether they had previously been members but still weren't so all of that's definitely an element of what we do what we look at yeah so um yeah emma's wondering about the and that's a that's a thing you know what is the perfect size group for good interaction and information sharing um uh, and and I, yeah, yeah. I don't think I was. I think that's not really what we looked at. We looked at membership in our groups rather than actual group size in terms of knowledge sharing. But there is research out there in terms of teamwork that shows the groups of five make the best decisions. Four to five. <laughs> that's something. Yeah, yeah. So if you want a committee, to um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and that's something that we grapple with with the groups in North Central as well, is that we sort of get a core group together and then as they become, you know, what you, you might call successful or they're having uh, events that is, is interest of for the wider community and you say, well, you need to invite everybody, they sort of say, oh, but we just like each other and we trust each other and we mm -hmm. share better just with each other. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, always balance. balance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, well, I better wind it up. So we'll have a bit of a, um, so thanks very much again, uh, Hannah Beth. I really appreciate um, your time and we'll uh, yeah, follow follow what's happening um, going forward. Um, so yeah, thanks again. And um, we'll, we'll just have, a, and hi, Michael. Michael's joined us from UTAS. So um, welcome online. I was just going to have a little five minute break, Michael, if that's okay. Um, so these guys have been online for, well, not quite an hour, but I just thought if I give them a little five minute break before we kick off with you, is, is that okay with you? That's entirely fine with me. Yep. Great. All right. Well, thanks guys. What we'll do is, um, yeah, we'll just take a, a five minutes or so. Um, you can stand up, stretch, a cup of tea, um, whatever you need to do. And then we'll come back um, a bit after. So maybe we'll say 2.40, um, if that's okay. And uh, then we'll, we'll kick off with Michael talking about um, soil digital mapping, which will be really great. So thank you all. We'll see you soon. <laughs> You're happy, happy to go? Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thanks very much for um, making yourself available. So yeah, I'd like to welcome Michael Roach from University of Tasmania. Uh, and I might let you, um, yeah, give yourself a bit of an introduction if you like, uh, Michael. I know you're a geologist. Um, yep, I can do my own introduction. That's fine. Yeah, just let great. me Just let me Thanks. hide this away so that it doesn't get too much in, in your view. Okay, my name is Michael Roach. I'm an earth scientist at the University of Tasmania. I've been here for 30 odd years and prior to that worked in industry for about 10 years. My background is I'm a geophysicist by training, but I've worked in a wide range of different applications, anything from, you know, big picture, big picture tectonic problems right through to archaeology and soil type problems. So what I'd like to talk to you a bit about today is about visualizations of soil profiles in particular, and also how we can integrate data to produce, if you like, digital soil maps. So just an outline of where I'd like to go. I'm going to first of all give you a little bit of a template for what we've been doing in Earth Sciences because I believe that this provides a bit of a, well, a template for how this might be applied in the fields of soils. And I'll talk about the, something called the Osgeol database. I want to com give a few comments about soil versus regolith. As an Earth Scientist, we tend to talk about regolith rather than talking about soil. And soil, of course, is part of the regolith. Um, I'll then want to talk a bit about digital data, how you can get it and what use it is. And I particularly want to focus on things like di digital elevation models and utilizing those, talking a bit about geology data and how you can integrate that together with my pet subject, which is of course geophysics. Then I'll talk about how we can then create visualizations that 
enable people from a remote location to be able to better appreciate the nature of the landscape and also the nature of, say, a soil pit. And then finally, I want to talk about how we can put all this together and give you an example of how this is done in QGIS and also an example of a virtual tour. But the virtual tour I'm going to illustrate is not a soils-based tour. I'll show you one from a, a geological perspective and ask you to, if you like, extrapolate that to what might be possible in a soils environment. So first of all, what I want to talk to you about, and I'm going to quickly cut out of um, PowerPoint to do this, is something called osgeol.org. So osgeol is the um, virtual library of Australia's geology. Just wait till I get there. So this is a library that we've put together over the last seven or eight years of the geology of Australia. And I think it provides a, if you like, a template for how much this might be done with soils. In this library, for instance, I can go to Australia. We've got three and a half thousand localities around Australia that we've documented. And let's just pick one at random. We'll go into a location near Ballarat. And at this location, I can go and look at a road cutting, for instance and look in detail at that road cutting. I can get all the details about this particular location and I can bring up a 3D model of this location. Notice that down here, there's a whole heap of embedded metadata that tells us about this particular locality. And then finally, once it does load fully, we've got a fully texture rendered three-dimensional representation of that road cutting available to you. So. At the moment, we have this working for geology around Australia, and we've got three and a half thousand localities that we've documented. And I really just wanted to show this as a means of illustrating that we this is one possible way that might that soils data might be effectively handled. Another way that we can deal with this in the Osgeol data database is to go and search on the basis of a site. So if I want to find all 3D models that contain the word fault. Oops. I can type it in here, filter the data set, and now there are hundreds of localities where we've documented a geological fault. So I want you to imagine, if you like, that an interface like this could be adapted for soils. Okay, back to the PowerPoint, wherever it is. So that was the Osgeol database. And as I said, I really just want to show that as an example of what might be done. Let's move forward and talk a little bit about regolith and soils. In earth sciences, we tend to talk about the material that mantles the solid rock as regolith rather than soil. So regolith is this entire blanket that overlies the unweathered bedrock, and it includes the material that you perhaps more commonly might call, call soil, but it includes other material as well. And I think it's important that when you go to mapping soils that you recognise that soils aren't just that very top layer that, well, aren't Soils alone aren't what make up the material over the bedrock. There's regolith material that underlies it. So to get an understanding of soils, you really need to understand the regolith. And regolith covers most of the continent. There's not many places where rocks stick actually out of the ground. And there's a complex series of factors that control the distribution of regolith in an Australian context. And I think it's important to understand these factors to decide on what, what information you require to undertake digital soil mapping. A few bits of terminology regarding regolith. The bit that you're most interested in probably is the bit you grow things in, which we might call the soil, but the soil might be a colluvial soil, for instance. Underlying that, there is um, other material, which is weathered bedrock. There's transported material, which we might call alluvium. All of these things are potentially materials that might come into the region where you are dealing with, that you are dealing with from the perspective of soils. If you're out in the middle of, say, the Hay Plains in Central Western New South Wales, then there's probably not much in the way of topography and there's not much in the way of landform processes happening. And so the soils could be relatively simple. However, if you're in a location in, say, the Central Western slopes of New South Wales with significant elevation changes, then there's a whole host of different factors that go together to create soils and also to move material around at the Earth's surface. So let's just look at some of those factors very briefly and then look at how we might be able to integrate those factors in a digital sense. So regolith and, and soil in the middle here, the factors that go together to produce regolith include what is the stuff underneath? And I'm an earth scientist, so my main interest is generally in terms of the bedrock, and we tend to regard the soil as being something of an annoyance on top. But in terms of what it adds to, what the bedrock contributes to the production of regolith, it includes things like different mineralogy depending upon different rocks, 
depending upon how the rocks are, say, fractured, the bedrock will break up in different ways. And then the weathering mechanisms. Has the material been weathered chemically or has it been weathered physically, for instance? The next thing that influences regolith and soil are surface processes. And so those are the effects of weathering, erosion, transportation and deposition. And they are largely controlled by, if you like, topography and hydrology at the surface. Then on top of that, very importantly, is climate. Climate has a very significant role to play in modifying and changing the nature of soils and the nature of, of regolith material at the Earth's surface. And then the thing that I know least about and which I'm not going to talk about at all really are the biological processes that influence, if you like, the very upper layers of the regolith and the bit that you find most important, which is, of course, the soils. So the question, I suppose, is how do we then map out all of these things? We have to integrate in a very and when in a combination of both objective and subjective manner, all of these factors, the bedrock together with the surface processes, potentially the climate and biota. So one of the keys that we utilize in geology to look at a landscape to understand things is a, a term, the present is the key to the past. And so we can look at modern processes in an area and these might provide useful clues to the way the regolith or the soil has developed in an area, for instance. But one thing we need to be conscious of in much of Australia is that in much of Australia, the regolith and soil is not reflective of necessarily of modern processes, but it's a relict of something that hap has happened in the past. And while it's important to understand those processes that evolved to create the landscape, it's really important to recognise that what you see in the soil is representative of things that have happened in the past that may not necessarily be representative of things that are currently happening because climatic conditions have changed, for instance. Okay, so where are we gonna get information to do this digitally? Probably one of the most useful repositories if you don't already go to this location for geological and data uh, relevant to the regolith and to soils is Geoscience Australia, which is the Australian federal government's geoscience agency. It provides free access to national geoscience data sets. These include geology, these include regolith mapping, so you can get detailed mapping of what the regolith is in a particular location, not just the soils, but the regolith. You can get information on the geochemistry of soils and the geochemistry of near surface materials. You can also get geophysical data that we'll talk about in greater detail later and also remote sensing data such as Landsat or ASTA data. So Geoscience Australia provides, if you like, the nation nationwide coverages but there are a host of other geological organisations. Each state and, and territory has one of these geological organisations. And these organisations tend to curate more detailed information. So if you're looking at a really large scale project, it may be appropriate to look at Geoscience Australia. If you're looking at a smaller scale project, then it may be more useful to get your information from the local statewide repositories. All of these repositories have free access to their data through a variety of different web interfaces. I'm not gonna try and illustrate them here. It's up to you to have a bit of a play with them. What about elevation data? If you're going to try and digitally map soils, then elevation information provides a fundamental part of that process because many processes in the landscape surface are driven by elevation differences. And so we really should be looking at ways to get digital elevation and the most useful interface to get digital elevation across the entirety of the Australian continent is something called Elvis. And the, uh, the web address to Elvis is at the bottom of the page here. And what Elvis enables you to do for anywhere in Australia simply by zooming in on an area is to download the digital elevation model in a format that's readily adaptable to a range of different software. So in some areas, and I've focused in on New South Wales in this case, there might be detailed high resolution information. So you can see that much of the Darling River catchment, immediate catchment has been mapped using LIDAR, meaning that we will have digital elevation with high spatial resolution, one meter pixels in these areas. However, if you're perhaps in the wheat belt in Southwest Western Australia, there is little high resolution data and you're left with much coarser data, but you probably all, may also be working at relatively large scale. Okay, so elevation data, as we'll see in a minute, is an important input into the process of digital soil mapping. And there are a number of products we can derive from elevation data that are useful in considering what might be the nature of the physical processes that are occurring at the landscape surface. 
I'd like to also tell you a little bit about geophysical data sets because geophysics is um, widely available, freely available for much of the earth, uh, for much of the Australian continent and other parts of the earth. And geophysical data sets give us the ability to look not just at the land surface, but beneath the land surface. And there are a number of very useful geophysical data sets that might be useful to you in a soil mapping context. And the first of these I'd like to talk about are things called gamma ray surveys, otherwise sometimes called radiometrics. And these are based upon the fact that some materials at the Earth's surface naturally emit gamma rays. And if we fly a low flying aircraft across the surface or carry a spectrometer around the landscape, then we can map out these variations. And instead of just looking at the top you know, micrometer or centimetre of the Earth's surface, these are telling us down to about 30 centimetres. So gamma ray surveys are incredibly useful because they are mapped to you as soil scientists or to you in the soil game, because they are mapping out the region that is probably in the range of say root growth for um, cropping plants, for instance. And to record this, we place something called a spectrometer in an aircraft, or we put it in a vehicle and drive back and forwards across a paddock, or we walk back and forwards across the paddock. And I'll show you some outputs of this a little bit later. And what do we really map? Well, we're able to map out the relative abundance primarily of three different elements plus a measure of the total amount of radiation. So those three different elements are potassium-40, um, thorium-232, and primarily uranium-238. And by looking at the relative variations in these three elements, it's possible to map out quite subtle variations and significant variations in soil character. So what sort of things are we mapping out? Well, we're looking at variations where potassium might be up to 2% of, of say, um, material at the Earth's crust, but um, the, radio, the radioactive part, part of it is only a very small proportion. Uranium and thorium are tiny trace amounts, but their distribution tells us a lot about both the original rock type and also landform process. So just to give you an example of that, and it doesn't matter that you don't fully understand necessarily the nature of this image, but it's what's called a ternary radiometric uh, image, and it's for the area around Bathurst in central western New South Wales. And so just look at it from the perspective of the ability to discriminate between different materials at the Earth's surface. Each of the different colours there is effectively representing a different material. And because the depth of investigation of this technique is 30 centimetres or so, we're really looking at variations in soil in this case. Soil which is reflecting the underlying geology, but effectively we are looking at soil. And just to show you how effective that is, on the right hand side here is the geology map for the Bathurst region and so what you can see is that the radiometric data is very well reflecting the geology which is also in turn very strongly related to the nature of the soils in these regions. So I can't stress to you enough that gamma ray data is a really valuable tool in trying to do digital mapping of soils and it's freely available for many areas on on the Australian continent through either Geoscience Australia or through one of the state organisations. Here just is a map then of the gamma ray data for Australia some years ago. There's a few of these holes have now been filled in, but you can download gamma ray data for just about anywhere on the Australian continent and you can do so freely through say Geoscience Australia. Okay, so I can't stress, I suppose, enough that as a geophysicist, I think this is something you really should get hold of if you're trying to map soils. Now, the scale, if you're only doing it for a single paddock, this airborne data may not be accurate enough or may not be detailed enough. If you need to, then you need to maybe do more additional gamma ray surveys. Now, I'll show you some results of those later. The next of the geophysical data sets is magnetic data. The Earth is a little bit overall like a bar magnet, and the Variations in bedrock and variations in the material in the regolith, or different materials in the bedrock and regolith may be magnetized and we can map that out. So what's the depth of investigation of this technique? Well, it's anywhere from right at the surface down to several kilometers. And we do this at a regional scale by again flying an aircraft across the landscape. And we can also do this at a ground-based survey, as a ground-based survey. And with a ground-based survey, we acquire much higher spatial resolution data and higher quality magnetic data, but albeit at a much slower rate. What we, can, what we can resolve with this sort of technique is determined by a combination of how high up we put the sensor and also how far apart we make the lines that we 
collect data. So what sort of information do we get from magnetics? The entire Australian continent is available to you as magnetic data. So if you're working in the Yilgarn province of Western Australia, you can go directly and download high, comparatively high resolution magnetic data covering your property or covering a, an entire catchment, for instance, and those data are readily available to you. Now, the example I'll show here is not an example necessarily related to soils, but if we focus in on, say, the Davenport Ranges in the Northern Territory, you can see the amazing detail that's afforded by the magnetic data. It tells us primarily about what's happening in the rocks beneath the regolith, but in some circumstances, it can also tell us about the regolith. But if the rocks are weathering in situ, then the magnetics is telling us about the likely properties of the in situ soils at these locations. The final geophysical data set I want to talk about are things, is something called electromagnetic data. Electromagnetic data helps us to map the subsurface variations in electrical conductivity. And what does this effectively enable us to do without digging holes? It enables us to map out, if you like, the distribution of clays in a, in a region or perhaps salt if, if you have an, a subsurface salt store, or in some cases we can map out the distribution of groundwater with these systems. There's a whole range of different electromagnetic systems. They work at different depths from aircraft-based systems that fly across the landscape and can map whole catchments through to small-scale systems like EM31 that might be useful for evaluating long-term salt storage because it can sense to a depth of about six meters through to things like an EM38 with a depth of investigation of one to two meters, which is probably telling you about electrical conductivity in the growing zone. So what did we get out of electromagnetic data? Here's an example from the Murray-Darling Basin. And the scale here is that we're looking at about 100 kilometers by 70 kilometers. And the electromagnetic data has been used to map out the salt load in the top five meters of the material at the Earth's surface, given in kilograms per cubic meter. And so the areas that are red in this diagram are clearly regions where there would be significant potential for drylands, the development of dryland salinity if agricultural practices weren't managed properly. And as a second example, here's an oblique view of a series of paddocks that have been mapped with EM38. And the variability that you see in these colored images is reflecting variability in the soil profile. Exactly what it means in this context, I couldn't tell you. And that's where things like soil pits come into play. So my advice is that if you are thinking about doing digital soil mapping of an area, you start with the remotely sensed data. You start with things like elevation data. You start with the pre-existing geophysical data. Um, you start with things like Landsat data, and that will give you the cues as to where the variability exists. Because going out then and digging soil pits is an expensive operation, and you're only usually limited to a finite number of these features. So targeting them on the basis of geomorphology and on the basis of geophysical data is the most appropriate way to do this in my view. Okay, so at this point now, I'd like to, if you like, get off my high horse about geophysical data and mapping things and talk about how we can go and visualize landscapes and visualize things like soil pits. So first of all, if you want to visualize landscapes, it's become incredibly easy in the last five years. And I'm not sure if any of you have access to this sort of technology, but to generate 360 degree imagery of a given locality, there are a variety of consumer brand, if you like, or consumer level 360 degree cameras now available. If we went back five years or so ago to get decent 360 imagery required you to utilize the digital SLR camera and something called a panorama head, and it was quite, time consuming. Nowadays, at the press of a button, it's possible to readily acquire a 360 degree image at a given locality. What 360 degree imagery gives you is the ability to look in context, to be able to say, to remotely show someone your site and say, this site lies, as you can see here at the foot of a slope, for instance. The other type of visualizations that I'm going to talk about are three dimensional models. And here's an example of a three-dimensional model of a soil pit here in Tasmania that has been generated by the process that's called digital photogrammetry that I'll outline a little bit later. So first of all, I'll talk a bit about 360 degree imagery. Then I'll talk about 3D models and how we produce them. And then I'll talk about how we can integrate those technologies together into single products that might assist in the process of digital soil mapping. 
So here's a 360 degree image obtained. This is on the University of Tasmania's farm at Cambridge, about 20 minutes out of Hobart. And this is a raw, if you like, 360 degree image at this locality. So it's called a 360 degree image because it spans the full 360 degrees from, from left to right, so that the pixel on the left-hand side directly adjoins the pixel on the right-hand side. And it also spans 180 degrees from directly beneath to directly above. And in essence, all the pixels at the top are directly uh, above your head and all the pixels at the bottom are directly beneath. But looking at an image like this in a flat view is not very instructive. You don't get much of the sense of the landscape. So what we do is we take these images into appropriate viewing systems that enable us to view them as though we were actually there. So here now is an example of that same image and I'm just spinning around on the spot. You can see that I can look down, I can look up, I can look around. And what it provides for us is if you like context. So now you can see the agricultural systems here. You can see the landscape systems. You can see that to the right and looking directly away from us at the moment, we're moving uphill, going down, we're probably moving down to a flat region, which is a more depositional surface. So, this provides us context and they're important to be able to tell a story because if you're trying to A, do digital mapping, B, convey your digital mapping to other stakeholders, then being able to tell this story is important. The next thing I want to talk about is generating 3D models, which we do by the process, commonly by the process of something called digital photogrammetry. And digital photogrammetry involves collecting images of a object, in this case it's a geological object rather than a soils object, it's some folded rocks at Cape Lip Trap in Victoria. But you can see on the left hand side we've collected a series of photographs which are shown by the little blue boxes. We don't actually have to know where we've collected those photos from, all we have to do is collect them. The computer sorts everything out for us. And we can generate something called a, initially called a point cloud, we can, from the point cloud we can make a triangulated model and then we can texture render that model. So I'm going to cut out of PowerPoint now and show you that process in software. So this is the soil pit that I showed you earlier. This is a three-dimensional rendition of that soil pit. And as you can see, as I move it around on the screen, you can I can zoom in on it, I can rotate it, all of that sort of stuff. I can come right in very close if I wish to and look at the details of this particular soil pit. I'm, oops, I'm inside the soil pit effectively. So it's a very effective way of being able to convey this information to someone remotely. And also very importantly, to document the soil pit. Sure, you might document the soil pit by making a sketch of it. This is a far more intuitive and complete way to document a soil pit because having dug a soil pit, you're probably going to fill it in shortly thereafter. Now, in this image, what you can see at the moment are the locations of the photos that I've utilized to generate this 3D model. So you can see there's 20 or so photographs generate, used to generate this 3D model. And you can see some of them have been, and I should point out that the little blue rectangles are the plane of the image sensor as calculated. And the little vector is showing you, if you like, the direction that the camera is pointed. <coughs> so in this case, you can see that there are a number of photographs that are documenting the entire geometry of the, of the soil pit. But I've also come down into the soil pit to focus on the textures within the soil pit. Notice also in this image, I've got a two-dimensional scale bar, and I've also got a color bar, which, give, which tells us that our colors are at least half reasonable in this particular case. So the digital photogrammetric process starts with those photographs, and, and then the photogrammetric process locates features that can be identified as common between, in, between pairs of photographs to generate this thing called a sparse point cloud. The sparse point cloud is then infilled to create something called a dense point cloud, which is this object now coming up on the screen. Then we try we create triangles between those points to create a triangulated model. What we've now got is we've captured the geometry of the whole. And then the final stage in the photogrammetric process is to texture render that geometry. So now we have a fully texture rendered three dimensional representation of a soil pit that is geometrically correct. It can be oriented such that it's correctly oriented in three-dimensional space and put fully in three-dimensional space. It's a digital representation of what that soil pit actually was and hopefully is a something that you could then utilize at some time in the future to make measurements. 
I'm not going to show you, but we've got some software that enables us to actually make measurements and to annotate these 3D models. I will, however, show you later on that it's possible to add things like audio to these models so that you can provide a description of what you think you've found in this locality. So that's an example of a 3D soil, a, a, an example of a 3D soil pit mapped in, um, in using photogrammetry. Cutting back to PowerPoint now, just bear with me. Okay. So that was the process that I illustrated. Start with photographs, generate sparse points, a dense point cloud, make it into a triangulated model, and then texture render the triangulated model. So how can you do this? You might say, well, this is obviously really high tech and we couldn't possibly do this in our particular location. Well, it turns out there's actually lots of different software that can do this. Some of these are free. Some of these are commercial products. The commercial products often have free versions with somewhat limited capability, but there are dozens of different software products that enable you to do photogrammetry. And I just referred you here to a review of the relative merits of different free versus commercial software. So you can get into this game of photogrammetry without having without having spent a dollar, basically. You can go and do photogrammetry with the free products. You can take the photographs with your phone. So how do you then go about sharing them? If you want to then collect information on, say, a soil pit you've acquired at, you know, in Burke in Western, in Western New South Wales and you want to share it with a colleague in the wheat belt in Western Australia, the most appropriate location to share that information is a online platform which is called Sketchfab. And Sketchfab is effectively the YouTube equivalent to 3D models. Anyone can upload their 3D models, anyone can look at them. You can password protect them if you wish. And the models display in any web browser and also display on mobile devices. And within Sketchfab, it's also possible to annotate your models, to put little um, notes on them, and also to attach things like audios and links to other features. You can get onto Sketchfab anytime you want. A free account will enable you to upload only a limited number of models. It might be something like one a month or something like that. However, if you're an educational organization, such as a university or can demonstrate educational criteria, then Sketchfab often will allow you free access to accounts that enable you to upload much more data. And so our OSIOL site, which is a, um, which is a um, if you like, a educational site, we're able to upload hundreds of models if we wish to. And we have three and a half thousand or four and a half thousand models there already. Okay, so Sketchfab is how you're gonna share the data. I wanna give you a little bit of a guideline about how you might go about generating these sort of visualizations. And the important thing is not the, so much the software that you utilize to stitch them all together. Even though different software will perform differently, all of them will produce a broadly equivalent result. However, the thing that really guides how good the application, how good your application is, is the quality of your photography. So basic guidelines are that if you want to capture an object, you photograph that object in many, from many different directions. How many different directions? Well, I always tell people that everything in your model that you're trying to resolve in three dimensions needs to appear in a minimum of three separate images from different locations. You don't stand in one location, take many photos, you move between every single photograph if possible. I can't give you a simple rule for how many images you need to acquire. If you've got a simple object, a big rounded rock in a paddock, then maybe eight or 10 photos is enough to make a reasonable rendition of it. However, if you have something with a much greater degree of complexity, which is commonly our case in geology, then we may, may require you know, tens to hundreds of different images to be able to make a good representation of that object in three dimensions in a digital form. So how do you take the photographs? First of all, oh, sorry, as a final comment, if you're not sure, then because photography is effectively free, you can just smash off more copies with your phone or your camera. If in doubt, collect additional images. So do you need to use expensive camera gear? No. So if you have an expensive DSLR, like the Canon camera in the top right hand corner, then that's great. They are really good for this process, but they're not necessary. You can get by with much more modest photographic equipment. And with decent phone photographs, it's very possible to make really good photogrammetric models. A few comments about how you should do this. 
always where possible shoot in manual mode. If your phone only does auto photos, you're gonna have more trouble getting things to stitch together because it will take different exposures depending upon which direction you're looking at the object from. So in manual mode, you can control that. So always shoot manual if possible. And when you're looking at an object and soil pits are really difficult ta tasks to photograph because on a bright sunny day, the ground surface is very bright, but if there's shadow in the soil pits, the shadows are very dark. The rule, of, the rule here is that you choose the brightest portion of the scene and you adjust your exposure to not overexpose the brightest portion of the scene. If you choose, say, the dark regions, you will overexpose the bright regions and you will lose those highlights. If you have the option, my comment is that it's always best to shoot in RAW. And RAW gives you the what's called a higher dynamic range. It gives you the ability to be able to recover the shadows and also have the highlights in the image. And finally, if you then need to subsequently process your imagery to say, bring out the shadows, it's really important that you do so in software. And there's a whole heap of different software that can do this. Really important that you do it in what's called batch mode. And the reason for that is that if you apply a certain enhancement to one image in a sequence, you must apply exactly the same enhancement to every image in that sequence. Otherwise, the photogrammetric process might fail. So any of you can now you know, leave after this talk and go out and acquire photography for digital photogrammetry. If you download some of the free software, you can build 3D models. You can then share them through Sketchfab. So how might we then decide to pull all of this data together? I want to talk about and demonstrate two different mechanisms for doing this. The first of these is to take all the data that I've spoken about, which are the data layers such as elevation and geophysical data sets, and you integrate them in a GIS system. Some of you who work for potentially large organizations might have ArcGIS. However, increasingly, most people tend to utilize QGIS because it's free. Anyone can download a copy of QGIS, and I will show you a QGIS project developed for the university farm in a moment here in Tasmania. The other way to integrate data is to generate something called a virtual tour. And virtual tours are great because they're standalone web-based tours. These things are best for outreach and education, whereas if you want to actually produce a map product, then QGIS is probably the most appropriate way to integrate your data. I don't have a good virtual tour for a soils-related project, but I'll show you an example of a virtual tour for geology and just ask you to um, pretend that this was soils, if you like. So first of all, what I'd like to do is now cut out of PowerPoint again and go directly to QGIS. Let me just get there. So I'm now in QGIS, which is a free geographic information system, system software. And the area that we're looking at here is the University of Tasmania Farm, which is about 20 minutes out of Hobart. It's about a thousand acres or maybe a bit more of um, property lying um, to the north of Hobart. And this is an area that we take our students for do, to do both geology and geophysics excursions. It's also an area that our soil scientist, Richard Doyle in particular, takes his students to undertake soil mapping. And so last year during, during COVID, we were left, well, Richard was left with the, pr the problem that he couldn't take people into the field. So we developed for him a um, virtual tour of the university farm in QGIS and his students then had to produce soil maps for the, for the region. I'll just zoom us back up on the region of interest when I find the right zoom button. So we'll zoom in on the southern area of the university farm. Some of the information that is available and which comes basically for free are things like the geology layer. So this is the geology from Mineral Resources Tasmania two different variants of the geology that you can see here, but the geology provides an important input layer to any assessment of soils. The next, of course, is hydrology. So we can look at the um, streamways and the dams in this particular location. The next is the digital, air, the digital elevation model. The digital elevation model provides the basis for our understanding of landscape process because the digital elevation model enables us to see regions which are potentially eroding, such as 
high steep regions such as up here and on the crest of this hill. It also enables us to see regions which are potentially depositional regions. So there's a wealth of information that's available within a digital elevation model. In this particular case, the digital elevation model that I'm dealing with is a digital elevation model derived from LIDAR data. And so what you can see in this image is that it has a very high resolution, one meter pixels, agricultural practices are clearly apparent in some of these paddocks. In addition, we can see the irregular nature of the landscape in this elevated hill. Some of these objects represent large boulders, for instance. So if you have LIDAR data, it's a bonus, but if you don't have LIDAR data, then it's still appropriate to utilize elevation data in your attempts to, to map soils. So there's the elevation data for the university farm, an elevated hill in the middle composed, as we can see, if we look at the geology of a particular rock type called Jurassic Dolerite, and then some regions of deposition around that. Now, from the digital elevation model, it's possible then to derive other parameters. And the first of these, of course, is slope, because slope has a significant impact upon how we go about mapping soils. If we have high slopes, such as the slopes that we see on the flank of this central hill and shown here in red, then these regions are likely to be regions of particular soil generation processes, maybe by colluvial emplacement of soils, but they're also likely to be regions of erosion and places where material is being stripped off and ultimately dumped into the more depositional regions of the image. So in this case, we've taken the digital elevation model and we've calculated a slope image. Another image that may or may not be useful is aspect. So this is showing you to which direction does the landscape slope. In this case, um, regions that are towards the north are shown in blue. Regions sloping towards the north are in blue. Regions shown sloping towards the east are in sort of orange. South is yellow, west is green. And so we have if you like the ability to look at slopes in different directions, because sometimes these might be important for different de development of soil and different development of natural vegetation in particular. Now in this area, I'll bring back the photo. In this area, my students who are geophysics students over the years have acquired geophysical data in this region. And I'll bring up and show you some of those geophysical data sets. So this is now what's called total count radiometric data. It's the total amount of gamma rays coming from the natural landscape surface without knowing too much about what the, what the geology and soils are showing is you can see there's clearly very obvious patterns in this data. So if you were to go out and thence do a soil investigation, it would be clearly obvious that you need to target this red area here because it's different from its surroundings or you need to target this bluey green area here and put some soil pits in that and compare them to what you see in the red regions because the radiometric mapping is mapping out variability in the top 30 centimetres of the Earth's material. And here shown as total amount of gamma rays, or we could reflect that in terms of the amount of potassium or the amount of uranium or the amount of thorium in this area. And the final data set that we have is the magnetic data for this region. So again, what this is clearly delineating is that there's something very different in this region when compared to this region over here or that region over there. And we can display the magnetic data in a whole host of different ways. And I won't bore you with the details of this at this stage, but each of these, each of these large paddocks were data that was acquired, say in the magnetic case was acquired in a couple of hours and the similar acquisition time for the radiometric data. So we've acquired perhaps 100 acre paddocks in a couple of hours of data acquisition. Okay, so in this context as well, within QGIS, we also have available to us three-dimensional um, 3D panoramas. And so now if everything's going to work well, I can click on one of these and it will take me on the landscape surface to that location. Here we are at one of the soil pits. I can look around, look at the depositional systems involved at this location. We're out in the middle of a relatively flat paddock. Here's the soil pit, which I can show you in 3D later on. And I can now also move around in here. So I could now, now move over to that location. There, come on load. And here's another soil pit. And we can see the context for that soil pit. Again, important to note context rather than merely looking at the soil in the pit 
and not looking at the surrounding landscape. So if we go even further over and if we go up onto the hill here, we can perhaps see a different sort of environment. It's still loading. So now we're up on the rocky slopes of the hill and you can see the university's radio telescope as well, but completely different nature of the landscape and different processes involved here because we're in a different land, landform region. So that's one class of information that we could bring up. Let's go back to QGIS. The other component that we've been able to load into here are the 3D soil, soil pits. So Richard Doyle has created a series of soil pits all around this particular area. And unfortunately we missed out on collecting. There's a few more in this region here, but I didn't have time to collect them. And so now we can go to these soil pits and we can go and look at one. The red ones here have annotation associated with them. Uh, let's actually, let's take you to one of the ones that we looked at before, I think it's this one. Let's see. No, I picked the wrong one. So I'll just go back and pick a different one. It's the one just down the hill from that one. Oh, thank you, Richard. I didn't realize you were here and listening. I hope I'm saying all the right things no, at this stage. Very good, very good. Very good. Okay, no, so this was very, very good for our students, yes. Okay. So I'll just continue and then I'll let Richard have, um, have some input here as well. So here now is a three-dimensional model of a, and you can hear Richard droning on in the background. I'll just bring my microphone closer to the computer. You may or may not have been able to hear Richard then, but, um, but this model has, has been annotated and Richard has added his his comments to it, and he's given a description of the nature of the soil profile. So in this case, this is a really effective method for sharing the experience and knowledge of an expert, in this case, Richard Doyle, with a wider audience. And so we can click on any one of these little blobs and it tells us that this is weathered sandy siltstone in this location, or we can click up the top here and it says this is the B1 soil horizon comprised of fine colluvium. So this just provides an example of what can be done in this sort of environment and with this sort of technology. Okay, I might just cut out of that and finish with just showing you what a virtual tour might look like. So going back to the PowerPoint, I said that if you want to integrate data and if you want to produce a map, then you really can't go past integrating this information in a GIS system. And I definitely advise you to utilize QGIS. If however, you want to communicate this information to a wider audience and you want to, if you like, educate people and conduct outreach, then generating a virtual tour is probably more appropriate. And I'll cut now to a virtual tour. So this is one we've made quite recently for King Island. And I'll take you, let's go to say Cape Wickham. So now we're at Cape Wickham. We've got a whole, this is now um, a web interface. This is running in any standard web browser. Will run on a on a phone, although we've had a few issues with that. Integrated into here, uh, audio. You may not be able to hear it, but there's me rabbiting on about the geology here. We've linked to a variety of references, so I can click here now, and the reference comes up directly on that particular rock mass. We've got maybe some other information. In our case, this is deformation history. This could, in the case of soils, be a neotectonic history telling you about the evolution of the landscape over the last million years, for instance. I'll go back from that. And then if we wish to, we can then also go to the map. So now I can zoom in on this locality and I might start with this one here. So we're at Cape Wickham on the northern end of King Island and we've got an airborne full spherical panorama. I can, from that airborne full spherical panorama, I can come down onto the ground to see the rocks now we're looking here at hard rocks, but you know, just realize of course that these could be, you know, this could be a, a paddock and you could be looking at a soil pit or looking at a natural exposure in a road cutting of some soils, for instance. We can add information about certain aspects of this tour. We can jump around in the tour from one location to another. I'll just go randomly to that location and see what's there. Okay, so here's some information. There's a microgranite dike in this locality. Lots of useful information can be presented in this form in a really intuitive manner. We can move from one image to another across the landscape. This is happening in near real in real time, coming across a web browser in this case from a server here at the University of Tasmania. But 
response would be just about as quick no matter where you are. So putting together something like this takes a little bit more effort in terms of the time required to generate the models and to generate the, the tour, but it provides a more intuitive and perhaps um, more engaging mechanism to be able to convey information about soils and landscape processes to a wide, wide ranging audiences in effect. So at that point, I think it's probably appropriate, I've rabbited on for far too long probably, I think it's appropriate that I shut down my thing and stop sharing the, the oops, let's just hit escape here, and I'll stop sharing my screen and basically ask if there are any questions or comments. I see Richard there now. And um, do you have any comments, Richard, that um, directly about what I've spoken about? I hope that I haven't overstepped my role as a geophysicist in talking about soils, but, um, mm. but do you have any comments about, about what I've said? said in a general sense, but more particularly about the process of digital soil mapping? No, no, I think it's all good. I think um, the problem problem is for people to take it all on. You know, there's a take it all in. There's a lot of information there. QGIS is pretty sophisticated bit of software. There's a lot of buttons to push. Well, there's tons and tons of help for people. Um, you know, it's pretty sophisticated. So it might be that they need a little bit of help with this Michael, I mean, even though I'm still learning with the QGIS and I've been using it on and off for a couple of years, it's, but the good thing is it's free and it's a massive amount of functionality with it. As well. There's a massive amount of data that's yeah. readily loaded into it. You can go to any of the government sites, you know, Geoscience Australia, you can go to any other, you know, Tasmanian government site, any other site, data will go straight into QGIS, go to CSIRO, they've got lots of other data. Mm. Yeah, and it was a lifesaver for me, like what Michael did for us last year was really valuable. I mean, I obviously love to take students in the field and the experience is more holistic in the field because they can feel the wind, the temperature, they can feel the sun and the aspect. So looking at an aspect max, great, but actually experiencing it in, in the flesh is, is always better, but it's not always possible and because of expense or travel or all the multiple reasons and so Michael's ability to put this together for us we fortunately already had the students out at the farm so they had seen it so it's always good to be able to build on something where they've physically been there um, but those 3D soil pits and you know the ability to, for the students essentially to do soil descriptions you know rough rough and ready they couldn't feel texture of the soil of course um, they couldn't prod it and feel how strong it was but um, to be able to do soil descriptions and get through and have a look at, you know, what do we have? 40 soil pits there, Michael? I think you did of about 50 that I've got out there for teaching. Yeah, I think, so, we, missed, I think we missed four or five, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I use that university farm because it's our farm and, and it's very varied. It's a tiny little farm, but it's got sandstone, dolerite and alluvium and colluvium and everything, as you could see from that range of stuff. And um, that was, it was really, really good, yeah. I mean, some students did choose nonetheless, and I think with farmers, they tend to like sit, to see and hold and touch things. A lot, of, I found that that year, a lot of students went and mapped on their own farms or paired up, and and about half the class actually didn't connect with the with the you know learning electronically. They really still wanted to do it physically, but you've got to remember we're talking about excellent students, and they've got access to farms and access to, and ability to get out. So um, I think. We should always see this science as you know building and adding on and not replacing i think that's i prefer to call it yeah digital soil mapping maybe it's, it's quite a sort of digital soil monitoring it modeling it's good it's a bit of both it's it's it's, it's both but um bringing the two together the field activity and uh, the um you know the, the web-based computer-based stuff is, is critical you've got to have the two together if you go if you just go it alone with entirely a computer approach i think you lose people yeah i don't i don't don't have any issues with that you know we want to get our students out in the field as much as possible and it's been been difficult um yes. as i as i've no doubt harped on to you about, about in the past richard that that i would advocate that people get hold of the freely available data before going out in the field make those assessments of how the you know, the landscape varies in terms of slope, in terms of aspect, do all of that sort of thing as a prelude to going out in the field. And, and by then integrating that with say publicly available geophysical data, um, you have a much better chance to target your soil pits into the right localities 
rather than going out with a backhoe on the first day and saying, well, where am I going to dig a hole now? Correct. You yeah. really should go out there with a plan. And the plan, in my view, should involve integration of all of these other data sets to make this most effective. Hmm. Um, any comments from the floor about what we've done and whether you see any applications to some of the things that you're doing? I, I'm not really familiar with um, what your backgrounds are. But they should plant and wear. I guess um, I'm, I'm happy for people to uh, unmute themselves and, and talk about what they're up to. I guess generally uh, they're working for NRM organisations or grower groups uh, in a research or project officer capacity. So they may be um, organising soil field days and those sort of things for landholders uh, or helping to coordinate research, um, you know, soil management research. Uh, type activities uh, in their local areas. So that's, um, yeah, and, and a varying experience um, in, in that respect um, from the group as well. So. I, I see significant benefit in making the sort of tours that I showed you at the end, where you can effectively suck the brain out of Richard Doyle and put it in, in a digital form to be able to show people. Because even if Richard runs a field day, certain people can't get there, he might run one a year. But by documenting it, capturing his knowledge, you're able to share that much more widely in my view. Yes, and I, the, I can see this here, like, um, well, just from my experience and, and the work that I do, which I think is uh, similar to the, the, pe the people participating, is, for example, last week I had um, two soil pits open um, and we just really just had them open. The farmers had a look at them. We did some soil classification um, and then we walked away from them. And I just felt like, oh, you know, we could have done so much more in documenting, like if I'd had a 360 degree camera or if I'd taken like the 20 or 30 photos you know, um, and capture that while it's open and then be able to to do like you had suggested, um, we can add value to, you know, however much it costs to open the, to, to dig a pit. Yeah, all, all your costs really are personnel costs. You know, the, the, your time to get in the field is what costs the project and then your backhoe driver who's dug the hole. And the additional cost to document these things with inexpensive 3D, 360 cameras and taking 20 photographs, which you then subsequently build, is just a, a trivial additional cost to the project for an amazing amount of archival information, in my view. Yeah, and that's sort of, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for the group, but that's how I feel, that if I had the skills to be able to add value to you know, a soil pit that we might have open. I wonder um, from the group if, if yeah, that would be of use um, to you guys. So I'm, yeah, happy to hear from others. If you, if you think that this would be something that, uh, this is something that the group, you know, this, this, the community of practice could support you guys. If you want to do something like this, then, you know, we have some funds to be able to support each of the groups to do it. Ellen, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to say thank you very much, Felicity, for being able to get Michael along. Um, Michael, I know I was one of the ones who was harassing you at the end of last year to try and okay. work out how to, or the best way to capture this information. Um, and I'm completely in agreement with you, Felicity. We spend a lot of money uh, digging, a, digging a pit, and especially in COVID where growers couldn't really get to them. But even just having that legacy reference to be able to go back to that it's it's really something that I, I think we need um and I just have one question to you Michael sometimes I turn off my wi-fi and my bluetooth um on my iphone is that something to vitally have on because I get this pop-up to say that my location services are sometimes not as good if I had them off so is it no. it's no. not a problem um and in fact you, the photogrammetry won't rely upon any positional information that's encoded in your image if you, unless you tell it explicitly to do so. On small scale projects where you're walking around a pit that's two and a half metres long, half a metre wide and in a paddock, the, the accuracy of handheld GPS effectively is not such that you could differentiate one end of the pit from the other in any case. 
And so there's no point in that, as long as you have at least a coordinate for the center of the pit and some sort of orientation. You'll note that in those images I showed you, we had a two dimensional scale bar. And that's a critical thing if you want to recover the three dimensionality of the object. You may say, so don't you need a 3D scale bar? That would be even better, but much harder to utilize. In order for us to be able to take a soil pit and place it in a real world coordinate system, we need a minimum of three coordinates in three dimensional space. And they're afforded to us if we lay, the, if we lay that two dimensional scale bar flat, then we have three coordinates. We have the two points, if you like, the north point and the east point, and then we have the point at which they intersect. Those three coordinates enable us to place these models in fully in three dimensional um, form. Now, although I didn't illustrate it, we have some other software called GeoVis 3D we use extensively in geology that you could take one of these soil pits and directly measure distances, thicknesses, all of these sorts of things. And it's actually set up to make a log so that you could just go into the soil, soil pit and say, okay, here are my interfaces. And, and as you do that, up will come a, a log on the right-hand side of the materials that you've logged in the soil pit. So we can actually do basically anything you, well, not anything, as Richard very importantly points out, you can't get it in your hand, you can't squeeze it, you can't decide if it's clay rich apart from maybe being able to see that the particles are too small for us to be able to resolve them. But you, um, you can do many of the geometric and many of the texturally related things on digital imagery. We can't, in geology, we can't assess mineralogy very rep readily within 3D space. Um, and we can't assess things like, you know, whether something is clay rich or silica rich or whatever, um, because you really need to touch it. And Michael, as you said, like with those five profiles where I had done the soil descriptions and had some basic data, you can um, record a little chat on what the, what everybody's looking at yep. and talk, talk through the data. So, yeah, that was one of the good things for the students is that it was 40 pits that they could look at, but five of them, they were worked examples. And so yep. we put, put little audios and... I just highlighted the key features of the soils to help them think about. So they were learning, oh, this is how you take a soil profile apart. And oh, this is what I'm looking at. And, you know, if I had a sample, I could measure salinity or pH, and this is what the value I would get, and this is how I'd do it. So they're kind of like exemplars. And then you have the other 40 that they could just go and have a bit of a go at themselves. So that's, for, that's from an educational perspective, teaching people how to do it um, in a university environment. If you were... If you were trying to document this for a grower group in central western New South Wales, you'd probably add, you'd probably add discussion to just about every one because you would want to be able to provide that information. Um, there was a question from Helen: Are the colour scale and two D reference easily found online? Answer is well, there's lots of colour scales that are available online. The two D scale bar that we have, we just bang them out ourselves. There's nothing you can buy. Yeah. Yeah, I get my own tapes made. Yep. I just get them done at um, Science or Us or something. They just print them. Um, um, there's but, also a question here. Will there be a day when desktop paddock scale soil analysis will be possible across Australia using the consistent soil classifications? I'm probably not the right person to speak on this. Maybe Richard, but um, when you say soil analysis, are you meaning... Um, chemical analysis or soil classification? What is the intent of that question? Felicity, would you like to unmute yourself? Classification. Yeah, um, classification. So, you know, what, we, what we're constantly looking at arches and looking at properties and trying to analyse what soil types they're likely to have. Yeah. We'd love to be able to do that more accurately without having to go into the field. So what I guess what I'm asking is, do you think that there ever will be a day when we'll have some fairly accurate analysis at the paddock scale so that we can actually look at a land holding in GIS and we can not just map elevation and slope and things like that, but we can actually show them exactly what soil types they've got on there? I think if I'll, I'll speak, and I'm sure Richard has lots to say about this. If if there if you're talking about really big paddocks, then airborne geophysical data is a is a godsend to you because 
the things like gamma ray mapping are really effective at picking variability. You probably still have to ground truth that to say this particular funny pink patch here represents something, but it always represents something. It always maps some sort of variability. But that typical data you're going to download from Geoscience Australia or a state survey will have a pixel size anywhere between 25 and 100 metres. And so, um, you know, a small scale paddock, you know, 50 acre paddock, it's probably not going to have enough information, you know, 5,000 acre paddock, it may well give you the sort of variability you require. Um, but then you really need ground truth to be able to then take that information and, and project it forward to make a, a map in my view. Richard, you're no doubt gonna, gonna comment here. No, no, well, um, look, as I say, these things are hand in hand. Um, we're getting, the vast project is trying to do this. It's the visualizing Australian soils now because the Kiwis are, are pulling out. Um, and that's trying to bring all the existing soil maps that have been done by state government and you know they use the national soil classification system for those soil maps but they are at different scales so it's like mike saying there sometimes you get really good scale sometimes you get very you know um, broad scale assessments and you know we've got soil maps for about a fifth of tasmania and you could just go onto the band information system tasmania and, and quickly find the soil type uh, the soil maps are there so you would it would be easy for you but it just depends what's available i mean i can you know i don't know whether you have these resources am i allowed to share screen and show you the land information system quickly to tasmania and and you'd have to okay. find similar systems yourselves whether they exist in your state so i don't i don't know but tasmania is a bit organized yeah so victoria and i was trying to remember it um they, um, if anyone from Victoria wants to remind me what it's called, but there is a state um, site where a, fair, a few soil pits have been dug and they've been uploaded. Um, and they, you, they're a bit hit and miss as well. Um, but WA has the soil quality website where I thought there was some points um, of with data a bit like the visualizing australian soils project is trying to do um but yeah you're right um is that, is that, i, I, is I just screen? comment yeah we can see you richard i'll just yeah. comment as well that um that um oh shit, what was i was going to say my brain's gone gone soft here for a second um i'll come back to you on that i i wanted to to add something in but i've i've lost it as i was watching richard's screen i sorry, lost sorry, lost uh, That's right. And uh, New South Wales has e spade, um, but again, they they I can understand where you're coming from, Felicity. Yes, like you say, they're sort of um, scattered dot points, um, probably not everywhere, and yeah, not at the scale that you're um, you're suggesting. So you, you you can see there, there's three you know soil maps. That's one I did in the south, and you know there's two adjoining it, and so we we can we can zoom in and. And, and click on that and it'll it will it, they're just the boundaries so but they're not the polygons i have to actually add the uh, soil map but it'll tell you what the soil types are so if i put the soil map on there's the actual soil map and i this blue one is a it's actually a sand dune so it'll tell us what type of soil there is i mean they haven't got photographs in the full chemical analysis uh but there are there's a report there so if you click on that it'll take you to the soil report um you know that i i wrote some time back on, on and you can you can look up the data for that soil so the land information system tasmania is very very comprehensive and it's just basically a mini gis system you can just turn layers on and off at, at will it's, it's very very easy to use add any type of layer there's three or four hundred layers here in tasmania so there's geology climate farming land capability everything you know you, if you just wanted to find out the land capability. So, so in answer to your question, yeah, some states are, you know, got this stuff sorted and some haven't. There's landslide information, you know, there's farming information, there's soil information. Look at the farming layers, there's climate change enterprise layers, and it just goes on and on. Farming layers, there's 36 land suitability. So if you want to know where to grow carrots in Tasmania, would you turn that on? And um, why am I not seeing a carrot map? Maybe I've got to zoom in a bit more. 
or it's taking some time. A question that I would ask all of you, do you think that a national repository of these sort of digital objects is something that's worth advocating for? So if you're going to document soil pits in the same way that we have our OSGEOL database that documents virtual geology around Australia, is there, is there benefit in having something for um, soils as well? I think so. I mean, there's, there's your carrot seed I, I think that's where uh, visualising Australian soils is sort of coming from, and um, they're looking at, I mean, from what I understand of the project, it's it's really a, a data a repository. You know, we, we get soil tests. There's some way to upload them and, and visualise them and, and make maps, whatever. Um, and I guess to be able to... Um, upload additional data like soil pits or um, yeah, further information. Here's an example where you can lay the, you know, the soil pit information over the top of the DEM. So you can, you can see how the soil types fit the landscape. And if you wanted to know that soil classification, then, you know, you can click on it and it tells you what the soil type is. So, I mean, yeah, you talked about East Bay and so forth, but I think this type of standard is where we should all be aiming at. And so an answer to the question, who was it asked the question? Felicity. Felicity. Yeah, the answer is should be yes. But at the end of the day, even that soil map's at a regional scale. That's not paddock scale information. You know, it might, yeah. it might, you can see how complex the terrain is there. It's very unlikely that that's one uniform soil type across that range of slopes, there's likely to be a bit more complexity than that. So the soil map at that scale is a bit of a simplification. Okay. Hmm. Hopefully that answers. And increasingly there are techniques for measuring soil properties more quickly uh, in the field and, and more remotely. I mean, Michael's shown some of those with the geophysical techniques. The geologists have led the way with this type of underground investigation through all the various means of seismic and magnetic and radiometric and electromagnetic um, to try and see what's under the ground. And some are good for soil because they can see, you know, 20, 30, 40 centimetres, maybe a metre, two metres into the ground. Uh, other geophysical techniques go very, very deep, of course. Um, so that marriage between soil, understanding soils and geophysics has got stronger and stronger. So that, that'll help and they'll keep getting better. And bringing people like Michael to bear and help us with soils uh, adds, adds that capacity because we need geof, you know, soil geophysicists, basically. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that's enough of an answer. Well, anyway, I hope, um, Felicity, that what I raved on about was sort of where you were, where you were hoping to go. Um, I, you, know, you gave me a pretty open, um, open topic to address, and I tried to address things that I thought might be of interest. And clearly, some of those other things we can talk a lot more about if people are interested. Yeah, no, I think it was um, fantastic, Michael, and, and bringing that whole of landscape uh, into the... Um, story as well, rather than just looking at the soil, but understanding the whole of landscape is um, is really important and being able to put those layers on to be able to uh, make a more informed decision. Um, I did ask a question around if any landholders or any of the groups were using EM38. So I think um, I did some a few years ago and I think some of you said that your landholders were using them. Um, and giving an indication of variability, really, I guess, across the, the landscape. Is that, for those of you who said, yes, they were using them, do you know what the landholders are using them for? Are they, is that just for measuring variability? Are they making management decisions um, around the results of those EM38s? Phoebe? Variability of landscape. Okay. Yep. So yeah, I guess 
the reason I wanted um, Michael to present on this topic and that, and Richard had said that he used it and said that it was uh, yeah really useful tool for um, teaching purposes. But like I was, and Helen had uh, said, just being able to capitalise on the work that we're doing in the field and being able to visualise it and share it um, and use it as a tool for with landholders. Um, I guess when we and as some of you have said yes, this is a great um, a great tool, and uh, and you'd like to know more. So um, I'd be keen to for you to send me an email and just let me know that if it's something that you would like to pursue, then possibly we could get some more intensive training. This was really just an overview of I guess what is possible, um, and yeah, perhaps there's. A, if Richard's, I mean, Michael, you made it sound like it was pretty straightforward. Take a few photos, upload it to the software. It all stitches itself together and um, it's tickety-boo. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the big thing is the quality of the photography. The, you know, the, the software is dead easy, really. And some, some bits of software have very few buttons and knobs to twirl and you just throw the data at it and they make models. But... The really important thing is getting the photography collected well. If you don't have good photography, you don't have a good model. Yeah. And so I was going to ask about using a flash, something like that. Is that some way of um, making, you know, all the pictures as bright as each other or is that is that a sort of a distortion factor? I, I didn't hear the very first part of that question. It broke up for me. Can you just repeat? Yeah, using the flash on the camera? No, you shouldn't do that because what... The photogrammetry relies upon finding the same feature in multiple photographs. And if you illuminate it in different ways from different directions, then it becomes much harder for the photogrammetry to work. That's why you set the camera to manual so that everything is exactly the same as you, as you move around. Um, and yeah, there's just tricks about how to set things up properly. Um, the question from Helen was, do you need a powerful computer? I run it on my laptop, but, um, you know, some run-of-the-mill laptops struggle a bit to do photogrammetry. Um, depends upon the number of photos you're trying to throw in, really. Um, and do you need, yeah, you know, desktops, big, powerful desktops make things faster? Some of these, um, some of these photogrammetry software have cloud services so that you can batch stuff off to the cloud if you want that to happen instead. Now Richard has, is it Richard showing oh, Yep, sorry, I was just showing, I mean, it might be for farming purposes, like uh, Michael's come at this very, from, very much from geology and soils, but look, with farmers, often it's land use history and it, you know, even functions, I, I feel we ought to you know, within the CRC, talk about this a little bit after Michael's presentation and think about what we might do. I mean, you talked about soil pits today and Michael's shown you all the kind of geophysical things that you can do and look at the aspect and all these things and then ultimately make that little story, that little virtual tour, which I think is amazing. It's the type of product you'd want at the end so that you could do one, say, for a particular land care group, they could do their region. But it might be that you actually put other data in there because Mike's coming from a geological point of view where they've got sort of sort of questions that they're often ants asking someone something like well i just thought i'd throw up google earth pro one of the things i use a lot is this history of photos and i don't know if many of you know about that but you can just scope back through time and just look at different time frames uh when these google earth photos were taken and some are in the you know winter some are in the summer some they're all in different times of the year and so one's able to see um the landscape change, where the wet areas are in the paddock, where the dry areas are, uh, what you know, what crops have been grown. And so it might be that you develop. Sorry, someone's ringing me, and I don't know how to turn it off quickly. Um, you might develop a, you know, a, a different type of field tour that's looking at the landscape change, looking yes at a few soil profiles, yes looking at three D pictures of the landscape but also looking at the plants and crops that are there and the successes, the saline areas or, you know, the eroding areas or the undergrazed, overgrazed or the benefits of, you know, a particular, let's say, regenerative pasture that you might have established. So I, I think you've just got to have a bit of a think about it and might be that we get, you know, if 
within the within the program Felicity whether you think about whether you want to develop an exemplar or one of these working with Mike to help him help get it an example of a what can be done from from more of a farming perspective and you, you know you guys could work that out and secondly maybe a little tutorial on how you'd go about developing that so we'll come in two two things one here's an example of what the sort of thing you need for farmers and then the other side's with a soil focus and a landscape focus and then the other side how would you put this together you know what did we do how did we make yeah. it just as kind of a suggestion. I think we should think about that. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yep, yep. I'm very, very happy to support um, something like that. I think, uh, yeah, that would be a great tool if the, if the groups, would, if they could see that it would be yeah. something that they could use to, um, yeah, collect that data and, and uh, keep a history of it for future use. So, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, well, we're nearly at the end. So um, it's been, yeah, thanks very much for everyone's questions and comments. It's been really great. And uh, thank you very much to Michael and um, you're sharing your screen, Richard, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. well, in fact, I've got to go. So yeah, no other worries. People, other people yeah. ringing me. Yeah, thank so. you very much, Richard, for your input. I really appreciate you joining us this afternoon. No worries. My pleasure. It's yeah, good to see you again, Mike. And yeah, thank you yeah. so much for what you did for us last year. It was awesome. Yeah, I'll wander up the hill at some stage and chat more with you. Brilliant. All right. Thanks, everybody. Nice okay. to see you all again. Right Sorry, on. I this morning's event. I got a good. bit run over. Sorry for that. <laughs> no worries. That's all right. Um, yeah, and thank you very much, Michael. I really appreciate your time. This okay. Afternoon. So it's been fantastic to hear what you've been up to. Um, okay. No worries. And everyone's shooting off, but I was just going to um, make a couple of... Oh, well, I'll send them an email and remind them. Yeah. Okay. Well, nice to meet you all, and I'm going to take off now as well. Yep. See you later. No Bye. Thanks, Michael. See you. Um, so I just wanted to remind everybody that the, um, the participants' uh, update is on Wednesday. So some of you are already involved in it, and some of you... Um, I may have been invited and I did send a reminder. So um, it's just online. So you can just jump in and out whenever, whenever you like, um, but you do need to register so that you can get the link. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to, to be a part of that. Um, I'm working on the extension Oz um, site to display and uh, show all the information that we've gathered and to share all the information and videos and webinars that we've um, put together. So that'll be available hopefully in the next week or two. I'll share a link to that. Uh, and again, um, just a reminder that we're hopefully getting together for the soil, CR, soil science conference at the end of June, early July. So um, I might just send another reminder out just to um, some of you have RSVP'd, so I really appreciate that. And I know it's still a bit uncertain as to whether We'll be able to travel or not, but I'd still like to get a bit of an idea from people um, if we are allowed to travel. Your intention on of um, attending that uh, soil science conference in Cairns at the end of June, which would be all expenses paid um, by the soil CRC. So um, we just need to work out the budget and stuff like that. That's all. Uh, but everyone is welcome to attend, uh, and I just need to get a bit of a an idea of. Hopefully we can all travel and get together and uh, catch up then. So, yeah, but I won't take up any more of your time. Thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate you guys being online and uh, interacting and all that sort of stuff.